Adele Blochbauer, who was painted by uh, Gustav Klimt, um, I was um, I was speaking about her being such an important patron of Viennese modernism, and that's really important to keep in mind because uh, Viennese modernism around the time period that Klimt painted this portrait was not mainstream. It was very um, elite. There were um, a few uh, individuals in Vienna who were primarily, as I was mentioning yesterday, of uh, Jewish um, backgrounds who supported modern art. But the majority of critics and patrons in Vienna were much, had, had a much more conservative taste. Um, the other thing that I think is worth bearing in mind is that Adele Blochbauer was a woman who uh, was a significant patron. And again, I think in the early 20th century, uh, keeping in mind that women didn't even have the right to vote yet, um, it is extraordinary that she uh, was able to be such a pioneer and so, uh, so closely affiliated with the progressive avant-garde artists. So for example, she was a uh, avid uh, patron of the uh, design cooperative called the Viennese Workshops or the Wiener Werkstätte. And uh, her apartment uh, that she shared with her husband Ferdinand uh, was actually entirely decorated in the modern style advocated by the Wiener Werkstätte. And on the right of this slide, you're seeing the um, sort of sales rooms of the Wiener Werkstätte in the Neustiftgasse. And you can see in the background here, for example, um, a uh, sculpture by Georges Min, the important uh, Belgian symbolist. So Adele Blochbauer uh, was an important uh, patron. She was Jewish and she was really a visionary who supported a group of artists who did not have the mainstream support. And she's also the only female uh, sitter of Gustav Klimt, whom he painted twice. He did a second portrait of her in 1912 that I'm showing you on the right hand side. So both her and her husband were key collectors of art and design in this time period that we call Vienna 1900, but which really extends from about 1867, which was the Austro-Hungarian Compromise uh, and uh, the, the end of the First World War 1918. So this is a very rich uh, time period. This is the time period in Vienna where we have uh, Schoenberg composing, where we have Sigmund Freud uh, starting to publish on psychoanalysis. Um, so this is a really rich moment in, in, in modernism in general. In 1938, as I was uh, mentioning yesterday, we know that Austria was annexed to uh, the Nazi Germany. So this is the famous uh, Anschluss. And the Bloch-Bauer family was uh, very um, for, was very much um, aware of uh, the dark clouds that were gathering uh, across Germany and uh, Europe, and they were able to leave Austria and flee the Nazis in 1938, so very early onwards. Many of their uh, fellow Jewish families in Vienna uh, did not uh, leave in time because they felt that they had fought in the First World War, they were important industrialists and bankers who had made the Austro-Hungarian Empire what it was. And so they were very um, sort of misled in believing that they would um, not be persecuted by the Nazis. When the family, and by this point in time, in 1938, I should mention that Adele Blochbauer uh, was dead. She died in 1925. But the family, of course, um, had this amazing art collection as well as all of the uh, Wiener Werkstätte furniture. So when they fled the Nazis in 1938, 
they uh, did uh, put all of their art collection and much of their objects uh, into storage, uh, believing that they will be able to either get the items uh, where when where they were settling uh, or uh, coming back to them at some point in the future. And like many families, uh, they were very uh, wrong in this belief because the minute that they left uh, Austria, the Nazis uh, took control of their considerable um, estate. And part of this estate, so they literally went into the storage company and confiscated all of the crates into which the possessions have been packed up into. And of course, they also took hold of Gustav Klimt's famous um, portrait of Adele Blochbauer from 1907. And you might have come across in uh, the past few years, this painting being called Die Frau in Gold or The Woman in Gold. And it's actually the title that the Nazis gave this artwork. They were the ones who called it uh, Woman in Gold. Uh, and the sinister reason behind it, of course, was that Bloch Bauer uh, immediately signaled a Jewish family, a Jewish link. So by renaming the painting, they were getting rid of the uh, Jewish um, connection. After the war, uh, the a painting um, ended up in the um, Austrian gallery, the Österreichische uh, Galerie in the Belvedere. And uh, it is here that all of the sort of heavy hitters of Viennese modernism during this time period that I call Vienna 1900 are displayed. So in this photograph I'm showing you here, you see a wonderful portrait of uh, Sheila's wife, Edith. You see another Klimt painting of um, Riedler, and you see here a, a Luke Schmakowski um, self-portrait. So today when you go to Vienna, and, and I'm sure some of you have been to Vienna, it is the Österreichische Galerie that is one of the sort of um, mandatory stops for anyone interested in modern art. And it is here in this gallery, in the Österreichische Galerie, that um, Gustav Klimt's Adele Bloch Bauer painting hung for 50 years after the First World War. And uh, in 1998, uh, the heirs of the uh, Bloch Bauer family started to launch a legal claim for the painting. And the individual who launched the claim was actually Adele Bloch Bauer's niece by the name of Maria Altmann, who by this point in time was living in California. And it's Maria Altmann who launched this legal claim for the painting uh, and brought a case directly against the Austrian uh, government. And it's interesting that that is 1998, because, of course, yesterday we were talking about the Washington Conference and the 11 principles. So I would certainly argue that the uh, legal claim uh, was made possible or, or came out of these uh, 11 principles. So 1998, as I said yesterday, is a very significant date for provenance research and for the restitution of Nazi looted art. Um, it might not be surprising to you that the Austrian government made it very difficult for uh, the Altman family to um, actually negotiate the claim. And it took eight years for the painting to finally be returned to the family. Uh, so the painting was was returned to the family in 2006. And here I'm showing you um, a photograph of Maria Altmann with the uh, Gustav Klimt portrait uh, right next to her. And I love this photograph because it gives you such a good sense of scale as well, because when we see the um, painting reproduced, I always feel it, it should be much larger than it actually is. But in reality, it is a very intimate, uh, very emotionally connoted um, portrait of her aunt. When the painting uh, was returned to the family, uh, as you can imagine, the legal costs that had been 
um, that the family had to uh, swallow during this uh, eight year court case were, were very high and the family decided to uh, sell the painting. And the painting was acquired by uh, Ronald Lauder, who is, of course, of the Lauder family, the famous cosmetics uh, family, who um, is basically um, who, who founded uh, an important museum for Viennese art in New York called the Neue Galerie. And Ronald Lauder acquired the painting for the Neue Galerie in 2006 for $135 million at the time. And I'm showing you here a photograph of him uh, essentially unveiling the painting. And again, um, I love how this is displayed. You've got, again, Georges Min, the um, Belgian symbolist, two um, sculptures of his uh, kneeling youth framing the portrait of Adele Blochbauer. And to the right, I'm showing you a poster because I think this is how some of you might have come across this painting beforehand, which is the movie called Woman in Gold, starring Helen Mirren and uh, Daniel Brühl, uh, who that came out, um, I can't really remember when it came out, but um, a couple of years ago now. And it it's a really good film if you haven't watched it. It uh, retraces the story of um, actually uh, Maria Altman um, deciding to uh, go after the Austrian uh, uh, government to get the painting back to the family. So this, I would say, is a very high profile case uh, that um, has received a lot of attention and that really signals to you um, the, the importance of thinking about the ownership history of artworks because, of course, uh, this is what has been broken so dramatically uh, with the Nazis coming to uh, power. I wanted to mention a second, so this is an important event, this court battle uh, coming to a conclusion in 2006 for provenance research in general because of the public attention it received, but also for the fact that it came directly after the Washington conference and it really showed that some of these principles were put into place and it put really on notice many public uh, galleries and museums that they might be holding uh, paintings with tainted provenances from the Nazi era and that they really need to investigate the provenance of these works and um, be willing to consider the idea that they might be uh, returned. I mean, I of course believe they should be returned, but some of the uh, museums and galleries of course argue otherwise. The second event that was really uh, important uh, that I wanted to talk to you about actually was before 1998. So, so the woman in gold case is sort of the, 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 the case that is always talked about as the big first um, restitution case in Austria to do with a painting coming out of this vibrant moment of uh, Viennese modernism, a Gustav Klimt painting. But there were actually two events that predate this, and I just wanted to talk about them because they are making for a fascinating uh, case study. And the first event goes back to 1996. It actually goes back uh, further than that, but it begins, so to speak, in 1996 with a um, sale put on by Christie's in Vienna um, at the Museum of Applied Arts, the so-called MAC. And it's the famous or at least within provenance research, famous Mauerbach benefit sale. The, I'm showing you here the uh, catalog for the auction in the center of the slide. To the right, I'm showing you uh, a photograph of the actual um, auction. And on the right, on the left, I'm showing you a photograph of a monastery, which is the monastery after which this uh, sale was named. This is the, the Mauerbach Monastery, which is in rural Austria. And it is in this monastery, in the uh, Charterhouse, that um, 
all of the paintings that were sold at this 1996 Christie's auction in Vienna had been stored and found. So it is at this monastery that uh, the Austrian government, remember we were talking yesterday that the Allied forces found these um, uh, endless uh, uh, depositories of uh, looted art um, and, the, and then returned them to the uh, governments uh, from which the looting had taken place. And the Austrian government basically put a big um, collection of artworks into this Mauerbach um, monastery. And when this sale happened in uh, 1996, let me just go back to this slide. It was considered to be the successful conclusion of a really long story. And the story, of course, begins, as I just mentioned, with the looting and stealing of thousands and thousands of artworks and objects from Austrian Jews by the Nazis. Uh, and um, as I said, when the war was over and these objects and artworks were uh, discovered in these various salt mines and other depositories, the ownership uh, was transferred of these lost, in quotation mark, objects was transferred to the Austrian uh, Republic with the mandate that they be returned to the rightful owners. By 1949, the Austrian Republic had returned 13,000 objects to uh, heirs or Holocaust survivors. And then things went dormant. They were stored again in another set of depositories and the Mauerbach um, um, monastery being one of them. And the Austrian government um, kind of forgot about them, made no effort at all to find any of the owners, even though they were mandated by the Allied powers to do so. And this is, so we're now in 1969. So an initial return had been made. The rest of the objects where the owners or the heirs of owners supposedly couldn't be found were put back into depositories, so disappeared again. And here enters the stage Simon Wiesenthal, uh, who some of you might uh, be familiar with. He's often called the uh, Nazi hunter. Uh, he was an Austrian Holocaust survivor and he made it his mission to um, uncover and bring to justice many of these um, Nazi middlemen who, after the Nazi era ended, went right back into being doctors and lawyers in Germany and in Austria. So he uh, came on the scene in 1969 and he actually forced the Austrian government to publish a list of all of the objects that were still in their um, care or that were still um, sort of in this waiting loop uh, where the owners or heirs of owners had not been found. And the list that was published in 1969 uh, featured 8,243 objects. And um, quite poignantly, and I think very uh, touchingly, uh, Simon Wiesenthal called this list the Gallery of Tears. So when you think about, to us, it's a number, it's over 8,000 objects. But each of these individual objects, be that a painting by a famous artist, or be that literally uh, a fork from a set of silverware, each of these objects had a connection to a former owner and the fate of this owner in the Holocaust. So the term gallery of tears, I think, is a very... Um, evocative term. So as a result of this list that was published in 1969, 543 claims were filed by heirs of Holocaust victims. So the, the list was published and families recognized objects on this list and then filed claims. 33 paintings were returned as a result of these claims. So uh, I think that's 
that I can't even comment on that. I think that is just um, extraordinary that that only 33 works were returned paintings. I'm talking here. So then things went quiet again. So we're moving from 1969 now to 1984 where a journalist working for the American uh, magazine Art News got a whiff of this situation, that there are still so many artworks and objects lingering away in storage in Austria. And uh, he writes an article for Art News. And just before the article hits the um, Art News, the New York Times publishes an article um, saying that because of the pressure exerted onto Austrian uh, officials by the uh, both US uh, con members of the US Congress, as well as this story about to be breaking the news, the Austrian uh, government decided that it will uh, auction off art that was confiscated by the Nazis. That luckily didn't come to fruition. Uh, instead, in 1986, the Austrian government restituted uh, the all of the, uh, the objects that were still in its depositories, in its storage facilities, to uh, the Jewish uh, successor organizations. So it was uh, restituted back to uh, the Jewish communities uh, in Austria. Um, and it was that they were then charged with uh, facilitating uh, the process of new uh, claims. And it is under the, uh, so the Austrian government relinquished at this point all t legal title to the artworks that had not been restituted. And things start to bed, start to move a little bit uh, when it is part of the uh, the um, the Jewish community in in Austria, 77 paintings and 236 objects uh, are returned um, to the heirs. But we still have uh, a considerable number of uh, objects and artworks, of course, at hand. And this is where the Mauerbach auction comes into place because it is that sort of remaining uh, cash, so to speak, that remaining uh, collection of artworks that is being uh, sold, auctioned off by the Federation of Jewish Communities of Austria in the Mauerbach sale of 1996. And the money that is raised by this auction, in quotation marks, benefit auction, uh, is considerable. It's 14.6 million and it goes directly to the Jewish community. So at this sale, we have over a thousand artworks that are being sold and uh, 586 paintings are part of that. And just an interesting link to what I was talking about earlier, it was actually uh, overseen, this auction was actually overseen by Ronald Lauder, who remember uh, bought Adele Blochbauer and runs the Neue Galerie in Vienna. And before the sale happened, the Austrian officials assured the Jewish community that the art objects were ownerless and that every possible effort, and I'm quoting here, every possible effort to establish and locate their rightful owners had been made. So you'd think this is where things end, but they don't because uh, two of my colleagues, provenance researchers, one of them uh, very prominent, Sophie Lilly, uh, and her colleague, Er Wachsmut, decided to really look into this a little bit more closely. Uh, and uh, Sophie Lilly was actually allowed to do, allowed because of course this is all um, um, government documents that she needs to consult. So she was allowed to do research on the remaining objects that had not been sold at the Jewish community. And she was able to actually establish the identity of the owners of a further 50 paintings that had previously been considered ownerless. Mm -hmm. And uh, Sophie Lilly and Air Waxmood mounted this exhibition again at the Museum of Applied Arts, the MAC, 
in 2009 called Recollecting. And it's a wonderful uh, play with words, of course, recollecting as in in remembering and recollecting um, yeah, memories, but also recollecting as in reassembling uh, collections. Uh, and so they uh, put together uh, not just artworks, but everyday objects, as you can see in this car. Um, I'm not sure what kind of car it is, but um, some of you in the audience uh, might be. And uh, Sophie Lilly actually found out that this very specific car was once owned by the Jewish um, 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 lawyer, uh, Richard Freund. So um, this is to show that uh, there is goodwill required on all uh, parties involved. And um, I think it is quite scandalous that it took really until the uh, early 2000s to come to um, an honest um, assessment of uh, the number of objects that were still in, um, in state ownership, but that really belonged to heirs of Holocaust victims who uh, were very much uh, keen to have those objects back. The other event that happened before the uh, lady uh, or, or woman in gold, before the Adele Bloch Bauer restitution uh, is uh, this one. And I'm talking about these two events because they really uh, enforced a fundamental rethinking of uh, restitution and provenance research in Austria. So the, the second case I wanted to really briefly mention to you, which is another one of those foundational uh, cases that really shifted attitudes, but also uh, laws to a certain degree, is the, the restitution of this uh, portrait by Egon Schiele, of his uh, model and um, lover, Wally Neuziel. He painted it in 1912, uh, and uh, Wally uh, um, was 17 years old when uh, Sheila met her in the previous year. So she's 18 in this painting. And it's actually one of two works, uh, and I'm sorry, I was remiss in adding the uh, Sheila self-portrait. Uh, it was intended as a pendant piece to a self-portrait by Sheila, where he actually leans the other way sort of into her. And this painting was subjected to a 13-year legal battle that uh, started in 1997, so a year before the Washington conference, and came to a uh, resolution in 2010. And uh, the story behind it is uh, fascinating because the painting had been in a very important collecting, collection of uh, modern art in Vienna called the Leopold Collection. And the Leopold Collection is a private collection, but um, in sort of a very sort of, um, what's the word? Uh, opaque kind of arrangement with the Austrian government. The Leopold collection is actually part of the museum's quarter uh, and uh, sits or is displayed in a large building that is uh, financed, um, that was built by the Austrian government and is maintained and run by the Austrian government. So it's a private collection in a public museum uh, space in the museum's quartier which some of you might be familiar with. It's a very important collection. And in uh, 1997, uh, the Museum of Modern Art in New York uh, held an exhibition of key works from the Leopold Collection in Vienna. And the title of the exhibition was Egon Schiele, the Leopold Collection in Vienna. And uh, Leopold, Rudolf Leopold is often um, considered as the uh, individual who put Egon Schiele 
on the art historical map. He uh, made uh, a fortune as a um, optician, well, not an optician subscribing glasses, but developing lens, et cetera, lenses, etc. And uh, he poured that money into his collection. And he must, I, I must give him credit, he really um, did collect Egon Schiele and Kokoschka um, and uh, some of the other um, avant-garde artists from the time period uh, of the early 20th century in Vienna before anybody else was interested in it. So uh, the Leopold collection traveled to, uh, well, the Schiele, key Schiele paintings and drawings and watercolors from the uh, Leopold collection traveled to New York uh, in 1997. And um, and everything was fine. It was a very successful exhibition until an article hit the New York Times on literally Christmas Eve, the 24th of December, 1997. And in this article, uh, the issue was raised that some of the paintings, two paintings in particular, and one of them being Vali that I just showed you, uh, might have a very problematic uh, provenance and uh, might have been uh, looted by the Nazis. When this article hit, the Manhattan District Attorney uh, subpoenaed the work uh, and wanted to keep the painting in the States, in the United States, until um, more research could be done to find out the validity of this claim. Now, the subpoena failed in the New York State Court, but in an extraordinary and unprecedented move, U.S. Customs in 1998, so early 1998, uh, took or sa say, sized Valley as stolen property. And because the argument went, it was stolen property, it had been imported on violation of federal US law. And a suit was filed to retrieve the painting by the US government. So the government gets involved here to retrieve the painting on behalf of the heirs. And that in 1998 was extraordinary news because a government, the U.S. was willing to spend resources on uh, retrieving or, uh, or restituting a painting to the heirs. So what's the story of this painting? Again, it's a long winded story and there is um, uh, actually a movie that's been made out of it. So I'm just going to quickly summarize. But the painting had been owned by the Viennese art dealer Lea Bondi. And Lea Bondi uh, was uh, a mover and shaker, really, of um, post First World War Viennese um, art market for modern art. And you can see her here. She was a formidable figure. Uh, you can see her here. And just to signal how important an individual she was, she actually was portrait, but had her portrait painted by the important Neue Sachlichkeit or new objectivity painter Christian Schad in 1927. And up in the right hand corner, I'm showing you a photograph of her with the cigarette in hand. I mean, she is just, um, I, you know, comes across as a, a very radical, very strong willed, very determined uh, woman making it in a still very um, male uh, dominated art world in Vienna uh, between the First and the Second World War. So Lea Bondi owned Valley painted by Egon Schiele in 1912. And it was her private property. So it wasn't part of her gallery. It was actually part of her private collection. And when the Nazis uh, annexed Austria, um, her gallery was uh, confiscated. Of course, she was Jewish. So therefore, um, it was uh, the gallery was Aryanized, meaning that a opportunist who had had an eye on her gallery for many years uh, stepped in 
and uh, took her gallery over. But uh, to add uh, more injury to this, uh, the Nazis also uh, uh, took her private collection from her apartment um, in Vienna. Now, I, can, I don't really have time, just looking at the time, to go into the details of the actual uh, restitution case. Um, but uh, the painting uh, ultimately ends up in the Österreichische Galerie, in the Austrian Gallery, in the uh, Belvedere, and um, uh, sorry, not in the, yeah, it ends up in the Belvedere. And then Rudolf Leopold of the Leopold collection makes some uh, exchanges of paintings because he wants this work very badly. Uh, and uh, the uh, Austrian Gallery um, gives the painting in exchange for some other works to Rudolf Leopold. So this is why uh, the painting is in the Leopold collection. And uh, this uh, seizure of the painting by the uh, U.S. Custom uh, Forces uh, and the sort of ensuing uh, legal battle uh, between uh, Leopold and Rudolf Leopold personally um, and the uh, U.S. Uh, government and the Bondi family uh, really brought the issue of restitution and Nazi art looting uh, to the attention of um, the Austrian uh, public. And there were a lot of interventions and demonstrations uh, and an uproar really in Austria in support of the Bondi family and in support of the US government. So not taking side with Leopold. And here is a, a wonderful um, uh, intervention or demonstration, as I would call it, uh, that happened in the context of this uproar where the um, activists went to the Leopold Museum in the museum's courtier and basically roped off the big large staircase that goes up to it and uh, some of the, the walls with this uh, tape. And um, you're familiar, obviously, with this tape from crime scenes. And here it actually reads looted art, crime scene of looted art, Raubkunst Tatort. So I think that's a very clever and very, again, forceful intervention. So basically declaring the Leopold Museum as a crime site of looted art. And um, the so there's a lot of back and forth. Uh, a lot of museums in North America actually get involved and they interestingly uh, side with the um, Leopold collection because basically the argument is what will happen to exhibitions if artworks that are being sent to America from Europe end up being confiscated and end up being embroiled in these legal battles. So uh, a lot of the, the museums were quite um, fearful of the repercussions of this involvement uh, by the uh, government. And there was some very problematic rhetoric that was uh, being thrown uh, back and forth. Uh, so, for example, Glenn D. Lowry, who was then the director of the Museum of Modern Art and who is continuing to be part of the board. So very high profile um, art politician, I want to call him, in New York. He stated in the context of this particular restitution case that, quote, one must be very careful to apply the standards of today to things that happened in the past, unquote. I'm just going to let that sit in the room for a moment, that quote. So in 2009, the U.S. District Court in New York was uh, allowing that this case is going to be proceeding to trial. But it never ended up going to trial because in 2010, Rudolf Leopold actually died. And the case was settled by his uh, widow with the heirs of the Bondi family. Uh, it was settled outside of court 
let's just go back to this slide. Um, and uh, the uh, Leopold Museum paid $19 million to the heirs of the Bondi uh, family in exchange for the portrait of Wally going back to the Leopold uh, Museum, which is where it continues to hang uh, today. And uh, the Bondi family was not particularly happy with uh, the painting being back at the Leopold collection and they were able to, and you won't be able to read it um, here, but if you go onto the website of the Leopold or if you actually go to the Leopold and look at the painting, the family was able to um, make the Leopold Museum put a plaque next to the painting that explains that this painting was stolen from uh, Leah Bondi and it, it gives you the sort of indented bits here. So this whole text here is all about the problematic provenance, the art, uh, the art looting by the Nazis and the court case that ensued. So whenever the painting goes anywhere, that information has to be supplied. So that's a small, small victory, I would say, for the uh, Bondi family. So I've talked about these two cases in such detail, 1996 and 1998, of course, but going uh, lasting quite a long time in terms of them being coming to a resolution, because I really wanted to stress that these cases shifted attitudes concerning restitution and compensation in Austria, but also on an international level. So after this, research and working groups all over Europe and the US were established and they were not just dealing with art objects, but also with the issue of dormant bank accounts in Switzerland, for example, and the compensation for forced labor. So these high profile art cases really started uh, a ripple effect, like a wave going outwards in uh, rethinking and really pushing compensation uh, for all of the uh, horrendous uh, wrongdoings of the Nazi regime. In Austria specifically, it changed attitudes uh, when it came to dealing with the country's Nazi past. In German, we have this wonderful term called Vergangenheitsbewältigung, coming to terms with one's past. Uh, and this was driven by the younger generation, by the very activists that, uh, for example, did this crime scene looted art intervention at the Leopold Museum, because they were uh, there were demonstrations against anti-Semitism in current society in Austria, and it is that younger generation that really started to move away from the predominant idea uh, in Austria that the Austrians were the Nazi regime's first uh, victim. So the rhetoric had been for a long time that the Anschluss, the annexation, actually came before uh, Poland's invasion and that the Austrians were the Nazis first victims. Now, when you look at photographs of the Viennese welcoming Hitler into Vienna in April of 1938, and when you see the Heldenplatz, one of the main public squares, rammed with people, hundreds and hundreds of people giving the Hitler salute, that story uh, is is just horrendous that that actually um, was able to be in circulation for so long. So it is these kinds of public cases that really shifted this the the sort of acknowledgement of moral and legal responsibilities for crimes con committed by Austrians during the Nazi era. Uh, it also acknowledged that previous restitution and compensation efforts were half-hearted and inconsistent and that often the poorest victims were neglected. Not everybody uh, is able to launch a high-profile court case uh, against a museum to get a painting back. Archives, as we talked yesterday, a little bit opened, so there was much better access. 
Uh, and um, even within the Jewish community, there was a change. Again, it's it. I would say it has to do with the generational change. Uh, we are having second generation Jews that are coming uh, of age now, and uh, not now, but came of age in the 1990s. Uh, and so the shore survivors uh, who were so paralyzed by the trauma that they uh, survived and who have this continuum fear of anti-Semitism, uh, the next generation was uh, much more proactive and much more ready to take on some of these uh, debates. And I think also this 1996 and 1998 uh, event uh, started started the discussion to uh, think about and start implementing restitution and compensation for the Roma, the Sinti, uh, for for homosexuals, so all of the other groups that were persecuted by um, the Nazis. So we are now in 2021, things have changed. The wheels are still turning very uh, slowly, but uh, there is much more research being done and uh, in the case of the uh, Austria, we have a uh, commitment to restitute and compensate uh, victims of Nazi looting in the territory of the Republic of Austria. Um, there's a historical commission that uh, uh, generated a massive report in 2003. It's 54 volumes containing the uh, result of this uh, research. 160 researchers were involved and they uh, looked at the legal and economic and um, historical um, sort of uh, repercussions or they were historians and legal personnel and economists. Um, and as I said yesterday, uh, today we're working much more closely in partnership uh, when it comes to um, uh, renaissance, restitution, uh, provenance research and restitution. And in 1998, I mean, just bear in mind 1998, these events finally forced the uh, Austrian government to pass an Art uh, Restitution Act, which means that there is now in place a legal framework for the restitution of art. The legal framework isn't perfect. It has a lot of loopholes. So, for example, uh, private individuals are very, very difficult to um, get to rest to to bring into the restitution. It's primarily geared towards uh, public institutions and museums. OK, I'm going to stop here. I had another case I wanted to uh, show you, but I want to leave a little bit of room uh, for discussion. So I'm I'm going I'm, I'm happy to uh, stop my presentation here and we can open up the uh, chat and see if we've got any comments or observations or um, questions. Thank you. You know, I work on, on Viennese modernism and I have been uh, actually personally involved in uh, a restitution case um, of a wonderful Klimt portrait. So for me, it's kind of hard to be uh, a very objective sort of um, observer. I'll just show you that if if we don't have the questions, I'll just quickly show you the uh, painting that um, I was, yes, absolutely. Lear, um, Ronald Lauder's family were from Austria. Yeah, and what was the last example? Yes, I'm just showing you right now. It's the Gertrude Lur portrait, or also known as Gertrude Felsovani, which um, is a portrait. Sorry, my PowerPoint is fairly slow. Um, it is uh, a portrait that was done earlier than Adele Bloch-Bauer. Um, yeah, so let's just see. It should be open in a moment. Uh, that was sold just very recently. Oh, here we go. We're coming to it. It's a beautiful portrait and it's um, of a family. So this is the, uh, the, so this is 
1902, before Adele Blochbauer. It's the portrait of uh, Gertrude Lur or Felsovani, which is her, her married name. The painting was sold at uh, Sotheby's uh, to uh, Joe Lewis, and um, the, the family, uh, the, the portrait had been restituted to the family after it being in a private collection, actually, uh, in, in Austria and basically been invisible for many, many years. So as you know, I'm interested in the history of psychiatry and sanatoria. And Gertrude Lur was actually the daughter of a very prominent owner, Anton Lur, of a sanatorium in Vienna. And when he died, she ran the sanatorium. Um, and so I came across her in the context of that research. And when I was working on this material, in the early 2000s, nobody knew where the painting actually was, and it ended up being in. So Gertrude Lur was a um, an amazing patron of the Wiener Werkstätte. There's two drawings that she owned by Gustav Klimt, and the painting had actually. So she had to leave, uh, flee. Austria with her family in 1938. She went to Berlin initially and then ended up in North America in uh, California. And her son, Anthony Felsovani, I was actually, um, he sadly died just before everything came to a resolution, but I was working with him, first of all, trying to find where the painting was, and it ended up being in the collection of a notorious Nazi collaborator, the filmmaker Gustav Uchitsky or Usitsky, uh, who did these movies for the Nazis like The Homecoming. And he was supposedly one of the illegitimate sons of Gustav Klimt, although that's an unproven claim. Uh, he got the painting uh, during the war when um, Gertrude Felsuvani had to leave uh, Vienna. And then her, his wife inherited the painting and it only came to light when when his wife opened the, the uh, foundation, the Gustav Klimt uh, Foundation in the early 2000s that um, we knew for sure that the painting was in this uh, collection. And it was then the minute it entered from the private collection to this foundation, that is when um, a claim could be brought and it was settled out of court and interestingly in the um, provenance actually I think I have a, uh, a so in the provenance it says for the Sotheby sale it says Klimt Foundation and the heirs of Gelta Felsovani ownership settlement agreed between the two parties in 2014 so uh, even in the provenance we see that there is um, clearly something at stake here but the money was, uh, it's, it was one of the most expensive paintings. Uh, it was uh, valued initially at about seven to eight uh, million pounds and it sold for 22 million pounds. That was the, the hammer price in the end. And we don't really know what the agreement was between the two parties who got how much, but um, it did come to resolution and now, uh, it is on the private yacht of Joe Lewis, who is uh, a, an investor from London, and he is a collector. So he has Lucien Freud, he has Chagall, he has um, Matisse's, and now he has a Klimt on his yacht anchored in Bermuda somewhere. So I'm still trying to, I still haven't seen the painting. I mean, I saw it when it was at the Sotheby's sales, but I'm still trying to finicle my way onto his yacht, but I don't think I'll be particularly lucky with that. So, yeah. Okay, thank you.